be talking about solar, how solar works. Uh, try to keep it, uh, try to keep, uh, I'll try to keep it very high level in terms of the core concepts and explain those. And towards the end, we'll go into a little more technical details. So hopefully, it will work for everybody. Right? Um, points that we will cover today. What do you mean by search? What is search? What are the search requirements? What are the requirements of a search infrastructure that we use? Right? Comparison of solar with other sort of conventional SQL or NoSQL relational databases for search. Uh, the actual architecture of solar. We have a bunch of slides on what all sort of general search architecture and a little bit of solar architecture both. Uh, and then a couple of examples on how we use solar in Trellis and how Google search sort of works. It doesn't use solar necessarily, but it, it sort of is its its own form of solar, but how, how that works as well. Uh, just some insight into that as well. And then towards the end, we'll talk about other search technologies that are out there, uh, open source technology that are out there. Okay. And any questions, uh, feel free to ask at any time. Everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, what do you mean by search? Obviously, the first thing when you think of search is Google search. You, you enter a search text, you get search results back, right? So, search index architecture, you see a, a list of results, right? But search can also be in different contexts. Like obviously, if you go to uh, Amazon.com, I think this is yeah. So you can search for products, right? You can search for things that you want to buy. So here we are searching for i3 laptop. You see the set of results for i3 laptops as well, right? Or it, again, it can be people search. In the case of LinkedIn, you can search for an architect, and you see a list of profiles as well, right? So search we use in very different. It has whole different. It started off with being Google search, but then search, the same search technology has been leveraged for product search, people search, and, and many more, and we'll go through that as well, right? So, what are the search requirements? Obviously, first is text search, right? simple text search. I, I enter a text, I have a bunch of documents with text in them, I, I can find that text in a document, right? On, on Google, I want to search for a file name, I can I give the path of a file name, and I can <coughs> search for the file name, right? Then, you get into interesting things like filters. Right? What if I only want to search for architects in New Delhi, right? Or i3 laptops with only, or I want to search for a mobile phone with only iOS, right? So these are all filters that come in, right? I want to search uh, people who are in Delhi or close to me, right? These are all called filters. So we are narrowing down the search results. Not text-based, but these are more sort of filters, right? So location can be a filter. Um, device type can be a filter and, and all, all the different filters that you see if you go back. For example, here we have the filters of notebook size, manufacturer, uh, uh, number of RAMs, and etc. etc. Right? So these are all filters that, that you're filtering as well. And similarly for uh, LinkedIn as well, by location, by relationship, by current company. Right? So these are all filters that show up as well. Right? So that's important to understand. And then the next part is sorting. How are we sorting the results? Right? So by default, everyone will sort by best match. And this is sort of the secret source that every, every Google has to show you search results according to it, which is called the best. But a lot of times, it'll give you the option of changing the sorting, right? So you can change the sorting to something like highest rated. Like in terms of people have given reviews on, on, on Amazon, highest rated product, right? Or you can be um, newest product. So it's the newest product that has been launched. Right? So you can change the sorting as well. So the idea is that. And sorting is complex, right, right? So best match could be related to a bunch of factors. It's not simply the more number of times text appears in a, in a page, right? Best match could have a lot of other things, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well, right? And then there are other features um, which are sort of, so text search has to be smart. That means that it includes something like uh, stemming and fuzzy matching. We'll go into details what that means. There's a concept of facets, which again helps with filtering. And then obviously there are different types of searches. Now image-based searches come up. Uh, and all sorts of different types of searches people are using as well, right? So those are sort of what a search engine or a search technology should, should solve, right? That's what you're trying to solve, right? Um, again, putting it in a different way, full text search, right? So reads should be really fast, right? Ideally, the premise of every search is text, right? You, you give a text term and then it searches. And then reads should be really, really fast. Writes can be still be slow. You can deal with a little bit of latency in terms of you enter, you create a new product on Amazon, it can take 10 minutes for it to show up in the search results. Right? It doesn't matter. Or it can take one hour, two hours later, it shows up in the search results. But reads should be really fast because a lot of users are searching. right? So Google, the number of users that are searching are, are billions of billions of millions of billions of users. And Google returns search results in point less than half a second. Right? And we'll talk about that as well. Right? Then various combination of filters, various combination of sorting. So it's not that the filters are predefined. right? User can select two or three filters, different types of filters. So it's an and of different filters. 
and similarly sorting as well. Right? Uh, Non-feature which usually search is not so sort of known for real time in the sense that which we talked about as well. Little staleness is not an issue. Right? So state it can be slightly stale. Usually it's okay. In most cases, in some cases it's not okay. Uh, and data integrity, right? Usually you don't use uh, search as a source of storage. Right? So it can be little lossy, so to speak. Right? It is the best effort match effectively, right? If if you're off by one percent, it, it won't affect any. If you don't show one product by mistake, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. If it's not a perfect algorithm, right? Doesn't have to be perfect. Okay? Clear on search. What 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 search is and what problem search is trying to fix, right? A search technology is trying to fix. Okay. Uh, then we talk about something more facetted search. This is sort of a, a, a recent development, but it's it's been around. The concept has been around, but sort of now people have started using it more and more. And it basically, in simple terms, refers to when you see filters on the left. You sort of see numbers as well, right? Which is sort of a suggestion in, in, in some ways of how to filter the result. If you filter the result by this facet or this filter, you'll get these many results. So it tells you beforehand only. When I'm only searching for architect, it's saying that these are the, all the architects, but if I search for Microsoft, my current companies, I'll get 8,000 results. Right? So it's already telling me, and it's a way of helping the user sort of <coughs> narrow down the search because currently the number of search results are. 1,244,000, right? Over here, right? 1 million, uh, 20, whatever, more than 1 million. So it's, it's, it's not uh, useful for the user of so many search results, right? So the, it's sort of a guidance in, in way of sort of, uh, and, and it's usually sorted. So it tells you the in current company, it shows you the top five companies, right? Sorted by number of architects in that company, if you select that. Similarly, so location. So United States is the highest number of architects. So it gives you a little more information just at the time of doing the search itself. Right? Basically helps the user narrow down the search without having to guess how to narrow it. Instead of him having to type other text words, I guess he's already typed, typed architect, that's his main text, and let's help him narrow it down. Right? So this is a relatively new concept and we'll talk more in detail as well. Uh, people, uh, in, from a technical point of view, people have conventionally used sort of the land stack as the most popular or any sort of even talk about the .NET stack, it's all sort of DB based, right? Uh, SQL, uh, RDMS based, right, is the correct term, right? So, uh, and people have sort of start, the first version of search that was launched was built on top of RDMS because that's where people were storing data, right, in general, transactional data. But these are some of the reasons why sort of, this is, uh, conventional RDMSs are not a good fit for search. Right? And, and these are some of the properties and because they have normalized data so actually when you want to read data it's a lot of joins that have to happen to actually read an object which again sort of defeats the purpose of search when you said you want to do really fast reads right? um, and also it assumes that only indexes are used for reads so only you're using sort of depending on the indexes that you define on the table you can usually primary key is the default index that's there in every table but additional indexes that you define you can sort of only read through them and even writes you can only do pretty much if it's indexed right then it's better. Right? Um, so it's basically optimized for transactional data, right? So asset transaction. Who knows what asset transaction is? Yeah. Atomicity, 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 Exactly, right? So atomicity, again when, when we talk about search it's not important that immediately starts going up. See? Consistency. Consistency we talked about, search can be a little lossy, doesn't matter. Right? I, isolation. Isolation, uh, in terms of more security and stuff around it, again, search isn't, usually doesn't have so many problems of security because you know, search is usually storing sort of mission critical data. Transaction isolation. Yeah, transaction isolation. Okay, transaction isolation. Okay. Transaction isolation. okay. Anyways, and point is, so I said is MySQL and all these RDMSs are made for asset transaction, right? they're optimized for that. Right? Um, there's lots of security which is there, which is, which is a good thing, but again, it may, might not be needed in search, right? Because you don't have different roles and permissions, who can read, who can write. It's usually, this is, I'm searching this, who can, who can enter data and who can read the data, right? Those are the two usually you care about in a search point of view, right? Uh, all data is stored in the file system conventionally, so all the table data is actually stored as columns in file system. The indexes are obviously stored in memory, but file reads again are sort of a little bit, uh, and you can do indexing, individual columns, uh, uh, and set or set of columns, right? You can decide a set of columns to index, but problem is, I've indexed, uh, I've indexed on location, I've indexed on current company. But if I'm searching for both, then MySQL doesn't can, can't create a query plan. It actually will only use one of the indexes, and the other index will have to do a full sort. Right? Uh, full, uh, 
Next one's come up, obviously, people transition from SQL to NoSQL. Okay, everybody's sort of familiar with NoSQL. Shivam gave a talk on Mongo as well, on what NoSQL is used for. And there, the storage is mainly for key value pairs, right? The idea is to take it, uh, uh, denormalize the data, which is great because that's what even search wants when you want to denormalize the data. It's unstructured data, right? That doesn't really play well because you still you don't know which. Uh, uh, and so, and it's also optimized for reads, right? So actually, you see that NoSQL is also actually optimized for reads to be really fast reads, but uh, writes can be slightly slow. Right? And that's exactly what I said as one, one of the search requirements. Right? So uh, data sort is also file system. In the indexing is individual fields and full text are built-in support. So NoSQL definitely comes a step further, a step closer to do to build to use for search as a backend. And a lot of people in today's day and age are using NoSQL actually as a search backend. But it, it still falters in some places, specifically the last three points, and we'll talk about those as well. Uh, in terms of solar, but now a lot of people we are seeing are using sort of NoSQL for search because it's that's their source of data because it, it, it does offer data consistency, it does offer isolation, so it, it, it sort of serves a, as the best of both worlds in terms of you have the, um, the some of the RDBS, RDBS, RDBMS features and you also have some of the search and sort of the the unstructured, denormalized uh, data which helps in searching as well, right? So that's why you see a lot of popularity with Mongo, Cassandra, Couchbase, all these NoSQL technologies that have become popular. Right? So now uh, we talk about advantage of Solo over MySQL, NoSQL, right? So the first point is important, it actually has a reverse index from day one. So what do you mean by reverse index? We'll talk about that. But basically the idea is that you take a document, right? Um, the document could be uh, today is a very good day, right? Or today is today is Tuesday, right? If that's a document, you break it up into sort of uh, tokens, and we we'll talk about how it does it. But at the simplest simplest level, it's made up of five words. Today is Tuesday, right? So three words, right? So what it'll do is it'll create a reverse index. So reverse index would mean that from the string today, you would have it pointing to the the document, right? So it basically go and add this current doc this document to three indexes. One is the today index, one is the is index, one is the Tuesday index, and we'll talk about how that works. So that sort of that that concept is core built into Solar from day one, right? So that's important to understand. Like that's what it, it's it's it, or Solar any of these search technologies reverse index. It's optimized for this reverse index or this text based index effectively, right? It has sort of mind blowing and mind blowing has sort of written it purposely because text an analysis, stemming, scoring, fuzziness. So text, like I said, text search is not just about simple today, searching today or Tuesday. It's also about a lot of these things, and we talk about what each of, each of, the, each of these mean. Text analysis, like NLP, natural language processing. Stemming is, um, and we talk about that. Stemming is, you can write, instead of today, you can write today's date. You can write uh, this morning. You can write, instead of Tuesday, you can write Tues. You can write T-U-E, right? You can instead of, um, when you're talking. So, so all of that, Fuzziness, again, by mistake, instead of writing Tuesday, you wrote, you misspelled Tuesday, right? So you wrote T -U -T -E -U -S -D -A -Y. So all these features, again, are very strong and inbuilt into sort of the, the core engine of uh, the, reverse, the reverse index that they built. It's sort of built into it, and you can easily turn it on and off, uh, basically, literally by a single uh, configuration. Then, uh, this next part is also very interesting. It has sort of a dynamic scoring function, right? In Solo, if you in MySQL, if you do indexing, it'll usually just return this. So you can only sort by ascending or descending, right? You can't create custom sorting functions. For example, uh, and we we get to this as well. It has custom scoring functions that says that, okay, let's give text match a weight of 50%. Let's give distance a weight of 20%. Let's give number of ratings this person has, has got a weight of 5% and let's add all of them up. Then that is the best match, right? So uh, MySQL cannot do that. MySQL you would just sort by, either you do sort by distance, comma, distance, comma, ascending or uh, uh, location, uh, number of ratings, comma, ascending. So it's, it's, it's a very sort of sequential way of sorting, right? So Solar gives you, and you can define very uh, crazy sort of scoring function. We might touch on it slightly but not too much. But it's, you can think of it different ways, right? Each parameter has different ways and you can assign different ways and you can boost things by like that and sort of come up with that. Um, it has a single document concept, so there's no sort of relations at all. So you're basically searching a document. 
Right? The document could be anything. A document can be a person in the case of LinkedIn. It can be a product in the case of Amazon. It can be a website or an HTML page in the case of Google. Right? So it has one concept of document. That's what you call a document. Right? And it has faceting support, faceting that we talked about in terms of the narrowing down support out of the box. Right? This has been added obviously over time. Initial, initial, initial versions that have it. Right? And like I said, it's optimized for search and search alone. Right? At scale without performance drops. So it can support millions and millions and billions and billions of queries per second. And with, with sharding and replication, and we talk about all of those things as well. Any questions? So far? So, uh, Solar Architecture actually made of um, two or three things. The first part is actually the indexing. Right? So, indexing, by what, what do I mean by indexing? Is you're given a document like we talked about. Right? You, you actually have a document. So, for example, this is a piece of text that says there are photos of my home, blah, blah, blah. It's a nice place to be. Right? So, you have sort of that's, it. So that's, the, that's the web page. Right? We're taking a web page example. Simple HTML is there simple static web page, right? Then what it does is actually, before indexing, it goes through a steps of filters and tokenizers. Right? So this is a getting a little more technical detail, but basically for each field that you define, so in this case, this is one field in the document, which is the HTML text of the document. You can apply different filters and tokenizers. So I've given an example over here. So here the uh, filter is HTML stripper. So it's, it's stripping away the HTML tags. So example, all the, the ahref, it's, it's removed the ahref, so that I only have text left. Right? So example, this is one example, simple example I'm giving. Then there's a white space tokenizer, means break up the text by all the white spaces that you see. So then it, what it does is, these are, the, these are the photos of my home, has been broken down into different key, different words. These, different tokens effectively, right? Tokenizer creates tokens. These are the... Right? Each word becomes a different token, effectively. And if it's repeating, it'll, it'll, it'll sort of uh, count. It'll give you a count as well. Right? And then you can have other tokenizers like lowercase tokenizers. So the idea is, you want to lowercase. It doesn't matter whether the third is capital or not. In our example, right? so lowercase is it, or these are capital or not. So and it lowercase is it as well. So like this, you have a full sort of library of uh, ready-made filters and tokenizers that are out there that sort of help you index the data. Then what effectively it'll do is, after I've created my final set of tokens, for each of these tokens, it will go back and insert this document as a reverse index, right? So wherever the, the these index is stored, point, wherever these is there, point this document, this document will get added to that index as well, right? So these are the tokens that get created. Um, so basically, update the inverted index based on the token, right? The idea is, how do you get from a field to a token you can decide? And it's very sort of configurable. They have these set of filters and tokenizers, and you get to a set of tokens, right? Um, and then you add it to the inverted index, right? And it has different indexes per field, and also in general, it's also smart about not just creating a simple index like you have in MySQL, but in keeping track of a lot of stats about the index, like right? which is the maximum, which is sort of the minimum, how many total entries there are, and stuff like that, which it uses at the time of searching as well, right? So clear about indexing. This is the first part, right? So that when you're actually inserting documents into the solo, into the index, right? So this is how it, you define a transformation of the document into tokens. And you can define different, for every field you can define different types of transformations that you want. <coughs> right? So this is the first part. Um, this is a more complicated diagram. I took it from somewhere, you don't have to talk, sort of talk through all of it. but. Um, In general, the indexing, you, you can write sort of data import handlers, as they are called, which is a little more technical, but basically you can actually pull from a SQL database and just write literally SQL queries to create documents. And I'll show an example of that as well. Right? You can actually, it has, uh, so in general, Solar exposes HTTP POST methods or simple REST API for actually updating and um, creating, up, inserting documents basically, right? And then, right, so these are the different processes that you can have. So remove duplicates, custom transformations, like we talked about. It has some logging and then indexer. And then it sort of adds it to the uh, the core index that it creates. And this is sort of the indexing pipeline that we talked about, right? Just shown in a different manner. 
its own that took to complete to confuse by that. And then Solo actually is run by some, something in the background called Lucene, which is an underlying sim of the different components. But uh, Lucene is again on a product by Apache, which is which Solo is built on top of. So Lucene is only the index, only the indexing at the top after the tokenization has been done, only for searching within the index. That's all Lucene does, right? So all the, so Solo is a wrapper on top of that. It has all of these other sort of things that are built on top. Okay, any questions so far? I mean, this is more clarification, the yeah. least knowledge of this one I've understood. Yeah. Suppose you create multiple indexes in this one, and suppose the document has got two pages, yeah. about 400 words, yeah. out of which there are 100, let's say 250 are non repeatable. Mm. And if I don't want to do word level search within the document, then I don't need a multi level level indexing, right? Correct. If right. I am doing this a search with the help of just a title, correct. Ecological, okay. so you uh, need geological yes. things. Then I don't need to. Otherwise, yes. it's a burden, right? So, so a document, so a document is made up of fields. So you actually have a schema, like an like a JSON schema or an XML. So you have a structure one. Like for example, your PDF. Your, your, your so what you do is, for example, like you, you only own the title, right? So then you only sort of it has a title. It has a context. So you would have to extract the title. So assuming that you write a preprocessor to extract the title, and then only only the title field you will index. That's it. And, and the then other, so that you can decide to do. The other piece you, you, you don't have to index. Right? Right. For example, in, in, in um, desktop search, right? Back in the day, when Microsoft, you don't used to search on the file name, right? But then they added functionality later on when they add, you could search within the files as well. Right? So that's within obviously much more expensive index because then every content of every file is also being indexed. Yeah. Right? So that you can decide how you want to optimize. Obviously, that becomes a data data problem. In terms of what you are, how much you want to index, what you want to index, you can store things in Solo without indexing them. Also, I will mean, we'll talk about that as well, right? Just for returning results faster. More indexing you do, more overheads you have. Absolutely, right, absolutely. So, so basically, it all comes down to for every document, the number of tokens you're creating. Mm. The more the number of tokens you're creating, the heavier the indexes, the more um, more computing power you need to throw at it in terms of RAM, in terms of replication, in terms of everything. It, is, it, it technically should still scale, but obviously with the same CPU, you require twice the amount of, you can do, depending on the number of tokens. Right? It just comes down to literally the number of tokens that you have, that you're creating for. For example, in one use case that we're doing, we're doing autocomplete search. Right? Now for autocomplete search, we can't store these tokens because these tokens don't work. So there's, a, there's another filter, that's called, another tokenizer, which is called an n-gram tokenizer. So we'll take a word like Rajat and actually spread it in tokens like RAJ, AJA, JAT. Okay. You create three tokens out of Raja because that's an n gram. So n gram is my three, three gram, all three, so that when I search for RAJ, immediately goes, finds Raja as, as an answer. Right? So, but that's more expensive because for every word that you're creating, splitting it into multiple tokens. Right? So, that, those are things to understand by where you want to do autocomplete or not because then autocomplete becomes effectively you're doing, right? Creating n gram tokenizers as well. So, it's effectively increasing the number of tokens by x or into x, right? A factor of x. So, I just have a question. Yeah. So, uh, we have all these indexes, right? That Correct. we have created and we have all these tokens. So, how is all this stuff stored and managed by Solar in terms of your indexes can become very easy? Yes. Right? So, what data structure does it typically use to maintain the indexes and how does it incrementally, how often does it incrementally add to the index and how do you make sure that you have very fast access to the index? Is yes. it always in memory? So we'll talk about that a little bit in the future, but what it, to, to answer it shortly is that each all indexes are technically written to file, but they are actually loaded into memory as well, but they are persisted to file, um, and um, it, it can scale. There are different scaling mechanisms. Most common are sharding. So actually, you shard the index. You say that all uh, in the case of text words, all ABCs are in this this uh, this computer all see all all words starting with def and this computer and so on and so you can shard it so sharding and we we'll talk about sharding as well and how about updating the index um, so and we we'll come to that as well it, it, it works best if you fully index all the documents at once because then it can optimize it, it creates it creates like a tree structure effectively internally which I haven't talked about yet but internally a tree structure and if you know the tree is um, has the minimum height when it's you creating it when you know all the possible combinations right moment you start incrementally add, adding things to the index on the fly, the tree becomes unbalanced and unbalanced more and more. Right? I mean, I'll maybe draw a diagram for that as well. So that therefore, they say of 15% or 20% more, if 15% of the documents are incrementally indexing or updating, then it, it makes sense to create a full index. 
and that's why I talk about indexing strategies, how often you should re-index and things like that as well. We'll cover that as well. So indexing, now that these indexes are created with the token, right? Now next part is the searching. Searching also follows the same sort of similar mechanism I'm talking again of only right now about text search, right? So you do a text search, there's again a query parser, like, like there was a document parser with the different tokenizers and filters. At the query time also you can decide the parsers and the tokenizers and the filters that you want to use, right? So basically I search for um, Cats in New York, right? Whatever cats. I search for cats, right? So, ideally, my to my index will probably only have the word cat, right? So, I might use a stemming token, right? Uh, stemming filter to actually convert cats into cat, which is the root word, right? Or if I say slept, slept to sleep, it will convert slept to sleep because I know that my index is optimized for the root words only, right? It doesn't matter to me whether the word was slept or sleep. I know people people are searching for the same thing, NYC or New York City. Right? So those kind of things I can apply at query time again. Right? So the idea is because then my index can only store the root words. Then in my index I don't have to store cat, cats, catting, kittens, all of these things. Right? Then at both, both times, at query time and at index time I apply sort of a similar parser so I get back to the root word. So I can apply those things again. Then and again does an index reader, it literally reads on the index, does scoring on the fly. And we'll talk a little bit about how scoring is done on the fly. It actually does everything in memory in a distributed manner and then creates the results back up right, at the top level. And so it actually searches parallel search across multiple indexes, sends out multiple hits and then sort of does like a merge sort, people are familiar with merge sort. Right? So it actually has sort of 15 to 10, 15 to 30 different indexes, it does a search in each one and starts merging, starts scoring and then merging the results. So take 100, 100, 100 from each and start merging them from the top most, right? Which out of these is the maximum for that number one? And, and so that, so this not sort of approach again gives it scalability and distributedness which you can then build into the system as well. Let's score all the documents and sort in async fashion. Right? So again, async rate sorts different parts of it and then combines. So again, it has broken down into different worker threads. And again, all of this is in a black box for us to use, but it's just important to know how it works so that we know that we are sort of using that. We don't have to get too much technical detail about these things. But just think that it's like a merge sort happening with many different workers, right? So it's all happening at asynchronously. All, all the child workers are doing lots of individual sorting and then they're sort of being rolled up into the top sorting, right? So that's searching. And this is actually where from, from the solar web that pulled up the entire solar architecture. If you actually don't want to know the technical component details, it's built on top of Java. It has sort of the storage schema storage and the index storage itself. Right? It has sort of your Lucene core um, with some sort of index replicator you can do. It has the application layer which is the which actually exposes the REST API at the top. So all your handlers and your response writers uh, and things like that. Uh, some of the processing units that it has inbuilt, deduplication, data import, language detection, index handlers, all these things. Right? And then at the top you sort of again it has client API, the client SDK is available with PHP. Python, .NET, right? And you can have a solo J client as well, which is a Java-based client, desktop application as well, right? So again, a rough idea, you don't have to get into too much detail, but I thought I'd just show, put it up there, right? Um, right, so again, talking about updating the index, so actually you can do three types of um, index updates. And actually, early two, first and second are sort of the same, same thing, they're called an incremental update. So the incremental update you can either do instantly, so for example a new user joins or a new product is added and you want to show it now. So either you at that point only make a REST API call uh, to Solar, then here's my new document or this document has been updated, re-index it. So document again is a schema, right? Is a, is a, is a JSON schema so it, and it has a unique document ID, right? So we need this will we need, right? It gets promoted, his title changes, Let's up, here's the updated document of the need, right? Similarly, so that's, you can choose to do it instantaneously, so it means you do it immediately, or incrementally means do it every five minutes, right? These are the, in the last five minutes, these 10 users have been added or modified, let's do it all together to optimize slightly. Obviously, instant is more expensive, incremental is slightly less because you're doing it every X minutes. And then full indexes, we actually say that, delete everything, and let's rebuild the documents again. Where are the documents again? So again, like I said, solo you very rarely use as a, 
store store for the documents, right? So ideally, all the JSON documents you store somewhere else in NoSQL or MySQL can be recreated from MySQL or from a file system also, and then you tell Solo. And is that uh, instant and incremental indexes cannot happen continuously, right? You cannot keep doing that because then the of the performance degradation happens a lot, right? Um, and there's no whiteboard here, but you can think of a tree structure, right? So you have uh, three nodes for, for uh, three levels node. The moment I start adding stuff, the tree becomes keeps on going and unbalanced because it doesn't know where it, it, not, it cannot keep the tree sort of balanced uh, and optimized in terms of the counts and all of that as well. So the more you keep doing that, the more the tree becomes unbalanced, more the performance degradation happens. And after about 15 or 20 percent, if the number of documents that you've added or updated is more than 15 20 percent of the total index size, then the performance gains like like there's a 2x or a 3x loss in terms of performance in terms of the time that it takes to respond. That's why they say that if that's happening too much, that, that's why instant you only do which is absolutely necessary, that you have to show it right now. Otherwise you again batch up all the incremental updates also into one. So every, every five minutes for example you do an incremental update. And full index they say again depending on how often your data is changing you do a completely new full index. Right? So again if my data is not changing, right, if, if it's a list of, I don't know, list of days in a year, right? it's not going to change ever, right? or list of days in a month, whatever, right? if it's a list of days not really changing, on day Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever, you don't need to sort of update, periodically index it, but, but ideally it's good practice to, again, because it, this, this takes care of two problems, it optimizes the index also, and any data loss or something that might have happened in the process, it sort of gets rid of that as well, makes it consistent as well, because you're recreating it from scratch, from the base data source, right? Any question? Okay. Right, so scalability, that's the other big big part. It has sort of scalability. Not inbuilt, this was added later on to solar, but it has sort of the principles were correctly correctly in place. Uh, so the first part is sharding, right? Sharding is what? So we already talked about briefly, saying that I split my index into different parts completely, right? For example, I will say that if I have two shards, I can do Anything starting with A to M on, on this computer, anything starting with M, N and beyond on the other computer. Then when somebody's searching, I'll search in both, <coughs> get the results back on both and then merge them. Right? Or I can be like uh, these or I can do it at the query level or I can do it at the document level. I can say that all engineers and technologists are in one shot and everybody else is on the other shot. Right? Like sort of you do and then when I'm searching for somebody, I'll search here and here. I search for Vineet over here and in the other one, and then I'll merge the results. Right? So we, we can do sharding, effectively the, dividing the documents into independent cells. Because each document is independent of the other document in, in the eyes of Solar. Right? So you can split it up into different computers. So you have a very small overhead of merging all of them because anyways is doing merge sort. So you have a very small, little more overhead of merging all of these again. But that's very only one more step at the top. Right? Obviously. If the shards become more than say 200, 300, then you have to optimize it further, but by and large it sort of works out. Right? Clear yeah, what sharding is? Hmm? So sharding, yeah. Okay, and you can sharding actually applies to all data sources. You can do it to MySQL, you can do it to NoSQL, all of them have sharding in it and a lot of as data grows. But the important thing about sharding is then you have to divide your data into mutually exclusive subsets, which are which have no relation to each other. So in, in database is slightly more difficult to do, right? Uh, but uh, but in NoSQL and in, in, in Solar it's easier to do because that, that's how you thought about the entire. You might have some data, right? Second is replication. Right? So replication is important because if one server goes down, you still want to serve, or if you have more load, you still want to serve, right? So the idea is replication. And third is actually how what Solar calls it called Solar Cloud, which is again. More recently introduced, before that you have to manually sort of manage these things. Uh, so there's something called Zookeeper which manages it. So assume we have three servers, right? Node 1, node 2, node 3. Right? And we've defined that we have a shard of three and a replication of a sharding factor of three means we have the document sharded into three ways and a replication factor of three. Means that each shard of data is shared in three different servers. Right? So then what we would do is if you only had sharding, you could only do this, right? Where shard 1 is shard 1, shard 2 is shard 1, shard 3 is shard 1, right? This is only sharding happening. Then the application where it does it, it stores all three shards on all three all three servers. But this is the primary shard being used effectively of that server. 
So this changes the order in terms of what, which, which primary shards it, it is serving. Right? So here I have nine copies. So I have three total copies of the data because shard one plus shard two plus shard three equals the total number of documents that I have. So but I have replicated them three times over. So even if one server goes down, or even if fact both servers go down, I can still continue to uh, serve all my documents. Right? And also not just for failover, but also for scale. Now I can actually Technically, also, I can query only one of these and get all my results back. Also, in terms of scale, I can I've increased my query capacity by three by showing the data three times. But that's it. Right? So it's a literally one to one, almost a one to one ratio on how how much scalable you want to be v versus the number of machines that you need to add. So if you want, if you want to double the number of queries per second on a hundred, you have to double the number of computers plus a very small percentage that you need to add, which sort of gives it infinite infinite quote unquote infinite scaling. For all practical purposes, right? That you would use, except maybe Google, who obviously optimized because then that's trillions of billions or trillions of documents you're talking about. Clear on scalability? How Solar achieve, achieves scalability? So, other features of the previous slide, sorry, I can turn it New slide. Huh? What if one of the instances fails? Exactly. So, one of the instances fails, so like to see the other instances have all the copies of the shards. They can automatically recover and all this will be. Go on one of the servers. Yeah, well, all the load, either, either so you can define oh, either all three active, three. either you can decide all three active or one of them is passive anyways. They are all active, three, all, all active copies. Then automatically it will sort of uh, balance it. Okay. Load balancing you still have to do at your end, but it makes sure that just by querying any, only these two you can create all the results back. Okay. Right? You, you can ensure. Obviously your uh, number of queries you can handle will go down because of the total number of servers. Yeah. Uh, is it decoupled with the main logic? Yes. This is decoupled with the main logic. Uh, it's built on top. Sharding is, so it's decoupled in the sense it was built after the fact, uh, it was built after Solo was originally built and then added as a module. So it's decoupled but it's, and that's one of the negative parts actually, if we talk about as elastic search which is a newer search and then it has all of these things inbuilt and so it can leverage it slightly more, right? But but yes, it is technically decoupled. So is it using SDFS file system or uh, elastic search? Uh, it uses uh, file system, you can again define which type of file system you want it to. But HD Hadoop file system is used by Elasticsearch, Solo I'm not sure of. Okay. Yeah. So, so for that, if that uses LTFS, this thing is done automatically. Exactly. So Elasticsearch has it inbuilt in there. In that I'm not sure about Solo. So other features, some of these things I talked about already. Stemming we talked about, like for example, the word stem, stemmer, stemming, stem are all based on the root word stem, right? So it's again optimizing. Fuzzy matching we talked about. Similar words, misspelling. There's a concept of edit distance. People know the concept of edit distance. Huh? So it's basically the number of mistypings between two words, right? So example, um, ceiling and ceiling is usually spelled S I E or S E I. It, you can have, you can compute the edit distance of two because the E and the I are. Or you can some people also do it if it's misspelled on the keyboard. How far is the how far is say E from I or how far is S from A? Right? If you misspell a word. So there's a lot of different complications, you can actually apply that as well. NLP is natural language processing. This is again a new buzzword. So Solar doesn't have it on inbuilt, but there are, there are plugins on top. So this is more like when you when you ask Google what is the weather in California, right? It automatically knows that you're searching for weather California. So it's the night or like you know, so okay Google or you, you so these are all natural language processing, these are plugins that have been added. Even Solar has support for that. Basically, the idea is to figure out the main entities from a query, which are the main nouns, right? So weather and California. What is the weather in California? You don't, the search engine doesn't care, right? It only cares about the terms weather and California. So that's a way of NLP. And there are plugins on top. So again, by default, Solar doesn't have support for it. It's an open source community. People are contributing new and new plugins, and you can plug and play, right? And much more, right? So like I said, it's open source, multiple plugins that people have added to it. You can contribute your own multiple parsers and tokenizers and uh, analyzers that are there. And you can sort of pick and choose any one of those that you want as well. Right? Uh, uh, so we're using Solar in Trellis and hopefully soon in a couple of other projects as well. Right? But basically the architecture is we are pulling in the, so like I said, architecture has two pieces. One is the indexing and then the, uh, so the indexing we're doing from MySQL. So we're using an import handler where JDBC, which is a Java-based uh, 
object driver, which we, we can write MySQL queries and it just creates documents, right? So every row in the result is a document that has been created. I'll show you an example also. And then the index update strategy, we have, like I said, we do incremented update every three, three or four minutes. So you want to see the, so let's talk first about the, how the, the actual, what it looks like. So there's a concept of a schema, every document has a schema, right, it's XML defined, can you see? Okay, Raju, it's fine. Right? So every um, document has a schema, this is actually the, uh, uh, and then you have fields, every document has different fields, right? So you can have, um, let me show some of the interesting fields, right? So, yeah, all these documents, for example, for the user, we are storing the experience ID, experience position, experience employee, experience department, experience de description in all different fields, right? And then you define the type of field, right? And at the bottom we'll say what those, so these are all strings, but you can see some of, we're using ints also, some of them are ints, so it's what's int as well as a, as a field type. And then we can decide which ones of these are indexed and which ones are not indexed. Um, so at the bottom if you go, so we define what the field types actually mean, right? So we actually have to, we have an in type of field and we have an int i type of field. One is that we're just storing it, which means that it's not indexed, index false. So I can decide which fields I actually want to index on. So I don't have to index all fields. I might want to store more fields just because I want to get back the search results really quickly, right? But and then I can store index true for my index i. So at the top, wherever you see index underscore i, those fields are indexed. Similarly for string, I have string and string underscore i. A short notation, so writing all this. And then this concept of multi value, right? Whether it can support an array. Just like whether it can support an array of multi value or not. Whether there's only one value is going to be, or it's going to be multiple values. Right? Um, and the default one that's there is called text. Right? Text? String only we use. So that's the schema, right? So as I said, a schema has, so solar, it does require a fixed schema of the fields that you're interested in. It's not unstructured data cannot come in. Right? You have to define the structure of these fields that you want to index or store in solar. Right? So every document will have a set of a schema. But you can have different collections. You can have different completely different instances of solar, different collections. So one instance for users, one instance, one in one collection for groups, one collection for taxonomies. They're all different collections with different schemas, but have no relation to each other at all. Right? You're only searching one collection at one point. Okay? Um, then here is sort of the uh, this is a config and sort of just saying that we are this is a full data import. It's for the full data import we're using a JDBC driver and the command is full import and some parameters that we pass in terms of the credit username and password for the database, right? How to connect to the database to get in, right? And the actual SQL, we actually create a SQL like this, right? So we actually, this is the document collection users, right? So how do I generate this? This is an entity user. Here's my SQL query. From that SQL query, column ID corresponds to my field in the schema called common object ID, right? So I get a list of rows. For each row, each row will become a new document of type user, right? Of type user because the document name is users. And these are the field mappings, right? So field mapping means from the email from here will become user email in my schema. Right? So I've shown the mapping of SQL columns effectively to solar, to solar schema document. Right? And then I can do com complex things like if I have a many to one relationship, I can do, I can create a, so in, in, my, in my, my SQL I have a many to one relationship between experiences and users. Right? So every user has multiple experiences. So for that, for every user I can, I can write a separate query to get all the experiences and put them in an array in solar. So sort of we have a concept of relations. So I put them in an array inside solar. And here's my mapping again that I'm doing. Um, right? So field called description, right? And here we have some custom JavaScript function, Java function or JavaScript function you can write that says strip HTML true. Right? So this is how I can write a data importer from my SQL, right? Otherwise I can also just use the REST API to actually push documents or a file system based importer that they have. You just write out a JSON file and then you could just say here's the file and import it. Right? You can do multiple ways of getting data into the system. So this is how you're doing it in solar, right? So these are data import handlers. 
They're all there. Then we have the query part, the filters and stuff I'm going to show you. <coughs> These are all different data and for different objects that we have events and all that. So there are three types of data. So I have a complex field called text, right? Uh, a field type text in, in our document and then we are doing different tokenizers and filters that we have right? We talked about tokenizers and filters. So, so you can see some, and these are all again standard token, tokenizer filters we found on the internet. People, other people have contributed, some come wrapped in solar. So you can just reuse that, right? So we have a standard tokenizer factory, word delimiter factory, right? So word delimiter factory again by spaces you uh, delimit the words, lowercase, repeat filter. So if a word is repeating, club it into one only. Water stem filter, this is the stemming, we get a, a default stemming that comes. Um, remove duplicate tokens, remove any duplicates that are related as a result of the stemming also, right? And at the time of query, again do this, so this, that's at the time of indexing, and this is at the time of query. Okay, so we have two parts, right? The, at the time of indexing, type index and type query. So at the time of query, when somebody is searching for text within this field, what other uh, tokenizers and filters do you get? And we're probably using ngram also somewhere. Yeah. This is for the autocomplete, right? So we have an ngram filter that we applied that says that gram size is 2. Right? So for every two letters, create a ngram. Right? So, we, so again, we don't have to do much, all of this is just configure it and you obviously give an understanding on how these things work, how to change it correctly, and, and you can use it, right? So that's sort of how we're using it uh, in terms of what it looks like. So this is the sort of default uh, solar admin. Again, this is solar out of the box. Solar comes with a dashboard and admin when you load in solar, right? And you can see sort of these are different collections. So each one is independent. So we are using for QA, we are using QA trellis. The taxonomies are being stored separately, right? Now I can go to QA trellis, okay? And I can actually just tell you some stats about total number of documents, 9,000 in QA, which version it is, right? Etc. Etc. I can do a full import. I can do some more analysis from here. I can write a query also, which I can just query for Raja. And this is a list of fields that you want to return. Right? So this is sort of the SQL query language, or the solar query language, right? So here you have the query. And FQ is the filter queries that you want to add. So I can add more filters over here, which are different from the queries, right? Because these are sort of, I can say that uh, users who live in Delhi, right? So I'm just passing location colon Delhi, right? As a filter. Sorting, I can define custom sorting, right? So actually sorting before that, we've actually shown sorting over here. Yeah. So this is sort of our sorting function that we said that we have different, so basically boost this field five times, right? And boost this field three times and boost the other fields one time. So you're given that if, if a match happens in the title, for example, then it has a bigger weightings, right? So I boost it five times, right? And if it happens in the description, then it's maybe three times. But it happens in the tags, or so, maybe it happens in the tags, it's three times. If it happens somewhere in the diction, in my experience description or something, then it's only 0 0.5 times, right? So, so then it automatically results in the title. So when I'm searching for architect, if it's in the title, it will give me a, those results will come first. This is like a custom sorting you can define. You can play around with it much more as well, right? So I can do this. There are all the other things that I won't get into as well. Um, and then I'll do a search and then it'll load back number of results, right? So it has a concept of num number of results found, 17. And these are the all, all the documents that are there, right? So this is one document. For example, this is Raja Jai. Right? For example, see in the five we have put only the title, right? Only the name of the user. And some of the in, in three we put the experience and things like that, which are slightly lower priority. Right? And so you can play around with this, you can actually see the tokens that are being generated also. So you can see whether your strategy is correct or not on both sides. See what the tokens on the search side and on the indexing side are. So it gives you a nice UI. And again, it's all HTTP based, you can actually just uh, use the same similar URLs and create a HTTP request, talk to Solar from an application. So uh, security we didn't talk about, Solar doesn't have too much security inbuilt. It has a simple username password if you want to add it. But that adds some overhead, so instead what people recommend is just uh, 
It's called security by obscurity. Obscurity means that you don't, you solar servers are only accessible from the app server and nowhere else. Right? So you actually whitelist the uh, IPs and the ports that can be opened. So we have people that match, eight people that match. Lots. There's a facets and filters both, right? So eight people match, one group match, no discussion match. Right? I can filter it further. Top tag. So we have a concept of tags. So out of the results that I have, one of them has a tag of agronomical agriculture biotechnology. Top groups. So there are two. There's one group maths two. There's one group vertex. So 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 again a way of filtering and faceting, right? That we have in here as well. So you can use these as well, right? So this is how we're using it. Okay. Any questions? So index only will return the, the, the list of results for text-based search and then you have to actually boost it. So it, it goes through all the results in memory and will, will add, add, like I said, breaks it down into smaller, smaller workers and then it will do the scoring all of them, right? So assuming that, yeah, so, so basically it will do this, uh, the scoring dynamically on the fly using async processes, right? Basically all these small, small workers will work on a small set, subset of data and then they will collate the, the boost. That's why that's the power of it. It is at all, um, from a VM point of view, the VM should be very high in memory usually, right? High in memory and disk should be, again, IOX, which is a SSD based disk, so it's faster on lookups as well. So that's what's, but CPU is never your really a, a limitation in solar, it's mostly the RAM size because it stores all of these things in memory, these indexes in memory. Yeah. What if we, we, I mean, there can be some logic while indexing the data that sorts that data according to that boost. I mean, uh, so every field has a different index, right? So, and I'm boosting at a field level mostly, right? So it doesn't, so I don't understand. It's only that I'm mixing, right? When I have more than one field, if I have more than one field, for example, first name should be 50%, 60% weight and last name should be 40% weight. But my first name index is independent of the, sec of the last name index. There's no sort of, if there's only one field and then there's no concept of boosting anymore, right? The only thing, the only thing it automatically does is it, it, it actually sees the number of times it appears. So if Rajat appears 10 times, it will return that document first by, by default. It has a default sorting and boosting mechanism also. So that's what, it, it has that basic, so you don't have to do anything out of the box also, right? Um, how Google search works, so Google actually has a, the indexing and searching are still the same, but it has a concept of crawling, right? So the first part is actually finding all the web pages. So when you're actually searching for Google, you're not searching the internet in real time. You're searching Google's index of the internet at that point in time, right? So that's an important part to know, right? So Google has actually stored the internet, all the pages that it has crawled. Crawl means, everybody knows what crawling is? You start at a page, you find all the links, you go to that page, you crawl, you see, take the text of that, you find all the links of that page, like a spider, right? So you start a, make a small web and you keep increasing the size of the web, all the links from those pages, right? So it seeds the internet with all these data and starts crawling, right? And robots.txt we use, people use to prevent crawling and things like that. And we don't have all of Then for indexing, what it does is again, like I said, too much incremental indexing is not good. So actually it keeps different indexes. It has an instant index, daily index, weekly index, and a long tail index, right? So basically websites, so for example, a news website will change daily, or even every two hours, right? So all the news website will actually add to its instant index. It means every three or four hours, it will keep rebuilding the entire index. And actually support for a lot of incremental updates. A daily index would be something like, maybe Trellis is a good example of a daily index. Right? Not too much changes, but enough changes that we want to re-index it, right? Then weekly and long tail. So like a blog post you've written two years ago is never going to change. Right? So, you, so you keep all of those such documents in the long tail index, which are not searched that often also. Right? The internet is huge, but if you see the, the you probably only search, the results that you see in the search results are only maybe 5 or 10 percent of the entire internet ever. Even if you search for an obscure keyword, right? So using what you are searching for and what web pages are out there, it sort of optimizes it and keeps it in fact different indexes with different update strategies. Right? So it will classify a website. Therefore, even for example, the Atlantis website, right? If you want to re-index it, sometimes you might have to wait up to three to four weeks before it shows up on Google because it's been identified by Google as a website, as a style that doesn't change too much. So it'll only, it'll only re-crawl it every so many number of days. 
that's how it does it, right? Because assuming it takes the top 10,000 sites which are updated on a daily basis and that's part of the instant and the daily index. Everything else is only crawled once a week for new data, or, right? And then it rebuilds the index, right? So it tries to prevent incremental index. And obviously searching it uses all these features that you've seen, right? In terms of NLP, stemming, autocorrect, all of these features are probably if you're going to talk more about the querying side of things as well. Right? Uh, and then ranking page rank, everybody knows, again, a sort of very high level page rank. Page rank? No. Page rank is a sorting function. So what got Google to fame? There were many search engines out there, Altavista, uh, brother. There are other, uh, Yahoo has its own search. Why did Google take because of page rank, right? Is it related to search engine optimization? No. Yeah, kind of. It is related to search engine optimization. Like suppose if I have a page and yes. the catalog is, yes. I have technical consulting. Suppose uh, in terms of SEO, if I mention the meta tags as a so, so, so exactly. So what people were doing before Google page rank came is that they used to just mention these words 50 times on their page, right? And people would think, oh, this page is about technical consulting. Google said no, let's let's find other pages which are talking about technical consulting that are linked to you. So example if yahoo.com links to atlogis.com with the term technical consulting next to the link, that then means that atlogis is about technical it consulting. Processes the meaning. No, no, no. It, it, it's seeing the incoming links. So page rank is all about the incoming number of links to you. So, so, for the so your importance of your web page is determined by the number of links that are coming into you about the topic. So it actually search the incoming link, the source of the incoming link document for the text, for the text, te technical consulting. Just because you put technical consulting 10 times and somebody is linking you, doesn't make you popular. That page should be talking about technical consulting and then linking to you. Then you are about technical consulting, right? Why will I as a website link to some other website? That's why you talk about all these link forms and SEO optimization people will back this page. Non-technical view of Google News, right? And then quickly, last uh, other search, Elastic Search is sort of the new, new, new kid on the block. It's again built on the same Lucene architecture, but it just tries to do everything from scratch and has sort of built-in scalability because of LDFC and uh, it uses only JSON instead of XML because Solar has XML, JSON both, but primarily XML you saw all the schemas and JSON is sort of the new notation and more lightweight notation now. And it's good for analytical querying actually. So. Apples to Apple solo is still faster for normal text querying, but for analytical querying and sort of a lot of filters, a lot of these things, uh, and for NLP and stuff, Elasticsearch is much, much faster in terms of benchmarking. And then there are other options which are really nobody else uses, Splunk and Spins, right? And obviously, Google has its own custom, Google doesn't use any of these. It has its own custom search engine that is built from scratch, right? Um, these are two popular ones that are being used right now. Solo obviously has the biggest community, and then Elasticsearch is the one that's up and coming now. Because it's again a lot of these things that are built from scratch inside. Okay. That's it. Um, these are the references, and you can obviously just Google the rest. Okay. And I want to any questions. Okay. This is a small question, but just actually, yeah. I think when we are working with Taj, actually, probably I'm not sure. Yeah. We have certain limitations in terms of queries and queries, you know, for the solar. Yes. I think you listed two or three times very uh, so called the complex queries. Yes. Then we thought of doing this. I don't remember that actually. Yes. Could share. Yes. Then we thought of instead of going for the solar, we go for the, the elastic, elastic search. Yes. Elastic search. So no, no, I like. I don't remember. There was a lot of discussion for three, four days. Okay, so, this is not supported and or something like that. So can you highlight what are the limitations? So solar, like I said, the, the main problem comes uh -huh. in terms of updates of indexes, basically. Right. So we don't have to update indexes a lot. For example, in the current project, one of the challenges that we will have is we have to actually maintain the availability of a user when the user is online or when the user is offline. And that can change multiple times during the day. And you actually only want to search for users who are currently online. Mm -hmm. You only want to search for users who are currently online, right? Mm -hmm. But assuming a chat application, right? Users come online, go offline, go online, go offline, right? But you only want to search for users who are online. 
there solar becomes a little weak, or you have to think of innovative ways of doing it outside of solar. Because otherwise, you'll be updating the index. Every user will be going, every time it goes online, you'll update the index. Every time it goes offline, you'll be updating the index. And you want it to be real time, right? It, it cannot be that, oh, you was up one line five minutes ago, ten minutes ago. That is something that you want to be more sort of real time. Right? So things like that is where sort of solar. Does it also have a limitation in terms of advanced queries, which I am able to. I yeah, so, so, so there are. Again, which it was not able to support, and we had to sort of go for. There was some combination. Yes, there was some combination of and or. I, I so don't so, so it doesn't support complex and or, but it has. Complex and or. It has something. fairly complex and or, but it has a limit on the. Yeah. So, so basically, so the, so the, the, the that specific problem you're doing the workaround by storing traditional data and solar. Yeah. As a result, the query was becoming very complex, right? Uh, excuse me. Something similar we do in Trellis also when we want to actually we have a group. So some groups are private, right? So that though, that content should not be searchable to users who are not members of the group. So for that we are actually passing the entire group list of the user as a query parameter, which is okay because of, so the query can be actually up to I think five MB or or ten MB big. But we are passing in an ID of 500 groups that the user belongs to, saying that only search within these groups. That's the only way of doing it because we don't want to maintain the group uh, membership inside Troll, inside inside, inside Solo, because that, that, that's too complex because that changes too frequently. Right? A user joins a group, leaves a group very often, right? Uh, likes a page, doesn't like a page, right? Very often. So we don't want to keep track of the group membership within Solo. So to overcome that, we send in the entire list of groups at query time. So these, are, so these are obviously some shortcomings that you have to find a work around for, right, which are not inherently supported by school. Right? Any other questions?